Thanksgiving is so important to God because it is a recognition that He is the source of all those blessings. And every time you give thanks to God, God is glorified. And whenever God is glorified, His hands continue to stretch out to bless. Kaya wag po nating uh, kalimutan magpasalamat. Bigyan ko kayo ng halimbawa. Kung meron, meron kayong kaibigan na gusto niyong paligayahan, paligayahin, tapos bumili kayo ng napakamahal na regalo. Tapos binigay niyo doon sa kaibigan niyo. Wala man lang thank you. How would you feel? How would you feel? Hindi man lang nagpasalamat. Pero iniisip mo siya, you were very thoughtful, you were very generous about your gift. I mean, that gift was given with a lot of love. And then, pagtanggap niya, tinanggap niya, pero wala man ng thank you. How would you feel? Gusto mo pa bang bigyan siya uli? Would you like to give him an, another gift again? Would you? Of course not, right? <laughs> That's why the New Testament is filled with exhortations to give thanks in everything, uh, you know, thanking God. And in, even in our prayers, we are to pray with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is such a repeated command in the New Testament. Because the Apostle Paul recognizes that thanksgiving is the key to the heart of God. If you want to really touch the heart of God, to make Him feel that He is appreciated, is truly honored, do not forget to give thanks. Amen? That's why in the book of Psalms, enter His gates with thanksgiving and his course we praise the first thing that god wants to hear is a thank you amen so if you want god to continue to release his blessings to your life acknowledge him that he is the source and never stop to give thanks to god amen this morning we're going to continue our series in the book of joshua and it's just very timely that the the story we're going to look in this series really applies to our, how we can really be prepared for this new year. I would like to invite you to open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 7. I will be reading from verse 1 up to verse 12. Okay, and we're talking about a very important subject that I want us all to reflect upon this morning. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1 to 7. This was after the fall of Jericho, right after the fall of Jericho. So verse 1, But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them, the devoted things, so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, to the east of Bethel, and told them, Go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. So about three thousand went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about thirty-six of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate, as far as the stone quarries and stuck, struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people, that is the Israelites, melted in fear and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel and this did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring these people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the, of the country will, will hear about this, and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? And the Lord said to Joshua, Stand up! What are you doing on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to to destruction. The only reason why Israel wins against her enemies is because God 
is with them. The moment God withdraws His presence and His favor, they experience defeat, just like they experience here in the, uh, in the battle against I. But let me give you a background about what this issue, what, what is this issue about devoted things? Why is it that when one of the soldiers of Israel took those devoted things, the entire army was defeated? Let's go back to Joshua chapter 6 and let's read from verse 15 up to verse 19. So you understand what this is. God has already given clear instructions to Joshua to tell the people about what they will do when they destroy Jericho. Remember Jericho? We've been talking about Jericho in the past messages. So Jericho was ultimately destroyed. But before they were about to march for the seventh time, it was after the seventh time marching that the walls of Jericho fall, fell. And that's when they entered Jericho and that's where they defeated the, the people of Jericho. He already gave instruction before that the falling of the walls of Jericho in verse 15 and following. On the seventh day, they go up, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army to shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be dis devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. Okay? God gave instructions to Joshua to tell the people of Israel, especially the army, that once you get into Jericho, everything in Jericho must be destroyed, except for Rahab and his household, because it was Rahab who hid the spies that were sent by Joshua to spy on Jericho. And because they were almost caught by the uh, soldiers of Jericho, Rahab, he said, I know God is with you. We have heard a story of how God, you know, did this, you know, how God opened the Jordan River for you, and we're all melting with fear. That's why I want to help you. I will protect you. So he, she hid the spies, so they were not killed. And then he, she helped them get out of the city by lowering them through the window. And that's why they made a promise that you and your family will be spared when the destruction comes. And so when Jericho's walls fell down, they did exactly what Joshua said, Rahab the prostitute was the only one spared among all the people of Jericho. God commanded everything that lives in Jericho must be put to death. Now sometimes you begin to ask the question, how can God be so cruel? I mean, why, why include the children? Why include the women? Okay? Why does God want all of the people in Jericho put to the sword? And that only Rahab and his house will be spared. That means nothing will be allowed to live. Okay? So I want you to understand that this this uh, event fulfills the word of God that he spoke to Abraham hundreds of years ago, okay? When Abraham, the ancestor of all these Israelites, received a covenant with God, including a promise, and there in that covenant, God himself told him what's going to happen in the future regarding his descendants. So I'm going to invite you to go to Genesis chapter 15. And let's read from verse 13 and following. Genesis 15, 13. This is the word that God said to Abraham hundreds of years ago. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace, unless you're going to die, and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, the land of Canaan, where a Abraham was standing, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. And let me explain what God is trying to say here. This was spoken to Abraham when Abraham still did not have any child. Okay, his wife was barren, so there was no Israelites yet. He was the father, the ancestor of all Israel. So while he did not have any children yet, God gave him his prophecy. He said, for 400 years, your descendants, his wife was barren, and he's talking about descendants, right? Your descendants 
will be strangers in a country not their own and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. Can you tell me what country that was? What country that will be where the descendants of Abraham, the Israelites, will be enslaved? What country? Mitzrayim, okay, or Egypt, okay? So Egypt, and according to the book of Exodus chapter 12, the, the, enslave, the enslavement of the Israelites in Egypt took 430 years to be exact. Can I say that? 430 years. So God was giving Abraham here a rounded figure. He said, 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. Were they mistreated? Right. That's why Moses tried to save one Israelite by killing an Egyptian because he saw how mistreated the, his fellow Israelite was. Okay? And so, God was saying, 400 years. And then you ask the question, why did God allow Israel to be slaves in Egypt for 400 years? God could have shortened that, right? Right? God could have shortened that. Why allow them to suffer for 400 years? That's how many generations. In those times, one generation is 100 years. I say they live longer than we do today. <laughs> okay? So you're talking about 400 years. That's four successive generations. Wow! Okay? And you're asking, why is God allowing that to happen? Well, remember, they are in a country not their own, right? God will later on give them their own place, right? The problem is that the place that God is about to give them, which God promised Abraham, is the land of Canaan, and there are many nations residing there. Do you understand that? So they cannot just enter in because they have to destroy everything that's there. And God forcibly withheld uh, the conquest of Canaan 400 years because of verse 16. Take a look at verse 16. There you are. In the fourth generation, that means after 400 years, Abraham, your descendants will come back here. Where? Where was, where was Abraham standing at the time? In the land of Canaan, the promised land. The land that God promised to Abraham to give to him and to his descendants. That's why it's called the promised land. Today, it's, we call that Israel. Okay, Canaan, okay? Your descendants will come back here. For the sin of the Amorites, now, he's giving us an, a reason why it will take four, genera four generations, okay? For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Okay, you know what the idea is? It's just a picture of a cup, okay, where you pour in wine. Now, a cup in the Old and New Testament can, can sometimes symbolize judgment when you're talking about the pouring of the contents of the cup. Like in the book of Revelation, remember, there were seven trumpets, seven seals, and seven cups or bowls of wrath. Okay? So, the meaning here is that God's, God is giving the Canaanites 400 years to repent. And He has set a timetable for them. Okay? He said, I will only bring your descendants to this land after 400 years. Because I'm giving the Canaanites in this land 400 years to repent. If not, I will kick them out of the land because I'm the landowner. I own the whole earth. Do you understand that? And I am the only one who decides who can stay in a particular area. We find that also in the message of uh, Peter, uh, sorry, of Paul in the book of Acts, where God has set, determined the bounds and boundaries of nations. Okay? And so, because God is the owner of the land, that's why God has the right to tell Abraham, to your descendants, I will give this land. In Abraham's life, the base, God owned the land. Okay? But he's going to give the, 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 the Canaanites 400 years to repent. Wow, that's long. Four generations during that time. Okay? And if they continue sinning, soon my cup will be filled. And when my cup is filled, that's when I pour out my wrath and judgment against them. Do you understand this? So God is saying to Abraham, your descendants have to stay in Egypt 400 years because I'm not yet done with the Canaanites. I'm still giving them a chance to repent. But if their sin reaches its full measure, that means it came to the point of time's up, full na, sobra na, that's just when I will pour out my wrath against them. And your descendants will come here, which means that your descendants will execute my judgment against these Canaanites. Do you understand that? So is God fair? 
Is God fair? He owns the whole earth. That's, you don't even own your life. He owns you. Right? And he gave this Canaanites 400 years to repent, precisely 430 according to Exodus. I mean, that's generous enough, right? And if because they needed to repent for 400 years, has God the full authority and right to destroy all of them? Does he have the right? Because they keep breaking his laws for 400 years. Okay? And God is going to use the descendants of Abraham to accomplish two things. Number one, to claim the promise that God gave to their ancestors that they will live in that land as their own. Secondly, to be the agent of God's judgment and wrath against the Canaanites. That's why the command of God to Israel and to Joshua, we enter the land, destroy everything that lives. Everything, because the time of judgment has come. And the Canaanites have no right, you know, to accuse God because they were given 400 years to repent. You understand this? Okay? That is why when God said to, remember this was their first battle inside the land of Canaan. Jericho was the entry point from the east to the land of Canaan. They had no other route into the Canaan except through Jericho. And Jericho was the first battle experience of Israel in the land. And God demonstrated his power by bringing down the thickest walls in the land. Jericho was the most fortified city in all of Canaan during that time because it was an entry point, a defense against foreign invaders trying to get into Canaan. Okay? And so God said, destroy everything in Jericho. No one will leave. Everything in Jericho is devoted to me. That means nobody can have claim to any life any property that is in there because they are all mine. To be devoted means, it means two things. A devoted thing is something that God declares is now his own property and therefore he has all the rights to do with them whatever he wants. And secondly, it is also a reminder that nobody else can touch these things because they are devoted to God. So anything devoted to God must be turned over to God and you cannot have hold any claim or authority over anything that's devoted. Do you understand that? And in the laws of Moses, when you do not destroy a devoted thing, the, but sorry, the devoted thing is to be destroyed by fire. Can we say fire? Because fire is the symbol of God's holiness. Holiness means being set apart. So all these things will be burned by fire because they had been set apart for the ownership of God alone. Nobody can lay claim of this. That's what you meant to have a devoted thing. The word for devoted thing in Hebrew is the word kerem. Can we say kerem? Now, what does that sound like? Kerem. What's the nearest English word that sounds like it? Kerem. Harem, right? What's a harem? What's a harem? The king's harem are what? It's a sacred precinct devoted only to the king. And that is where all the women are placed. The concubines of the king form his harem. Nobody can touch these women except the king because this, these women are harem dedicated, devoted only to the king. They cannot have a boyfriend. They cannot, have, they cannot be married to any man because they are devoted to the king. That's why they're called harem or harem, those devoted to the king. Do you understand now? That is the meaning of the word harem. Okay? Anything devoted to the king and nobody has any right to touch them. If they touch them, they will die. Okay? So, that is the concept here that God is saying, when I declare this is mine, don't you dare touch what is mine. Okay? And so, he's saying, destroy everything. The problem is that one of the soldiers did not obey God, right? Okay, and who was that? Take a look at verse 1 of, Genesis, of Joshua 7. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the kerem, the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of those devoted things in Jericho. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now, you want to know what he took? Okay, he later on confesses to Joshua that he did stay. He did, he did take some of the devoted things in Jericho that God forbade for anyone to touch. Okay? So verse 20, uh, can you go to verse 20 of chapter 7? He said, this is what I have done. I have sinned. This is what I have done. Verse 21. 
When I saw in the plunder, that's in Jericho, a beautiful robe from Babylonia. This is a very colorful robe, only for the wealthy. It must have been owned by a high-ranking official in Jericho who was already put to death by the Israelites, okay? I found this uh, beautiful robe from Babylonia, which is very expensive if it's imported from Babylonia. 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Okay. You remember what God said? Can you go back to chapter 6, please? Verse 18, especially verse 18 to 19. This is God's command. But keep away from the kerem so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. That's why Israel was defeated by the people of Ai. This God was no longer there because somebody took a devoted thing. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble to it. Is that what happened to the Israel army? They were completely defeated. Okay? Because somebody compromised. Somebody in the camp compromised and disobeyed God. Okay? All the silver and gold. Remember? Achan took what? A Babylonian robe, silver and gold. The Babylonian robe should have been destroyed by fire. He didn't. He took it aside. The silver and gold is supposed to be placed where? In the Lord's treasury. He stole it from God. Because the moment God said, this is devoted to me, anyone that takes that for himself steals from me because that is mine. You understand that? So, he must go to the treasury. But this man, Achan, took silver and gold and hid them, coveted them. He confessed he coveted them. And because he compromised, because he disobeyed God by taking a, a kerem, God allowed Israel to be defeated. He did not go with them in the battle against Ai, which was the next uh, city they were supposed to defeat. Do you understand this? Okay? So what is the significance of this? Very important. How many of you have made promises to God that you will give Him something or you offer your life to Him because of something good he has done for you. Have you made promises to God? The moment you make a promise to God, you make a vow to God, what you vow is now devoted to God. And you should not hesitate to give it because you made a promise. Let me show you. Take a look at book of, the book of Acts. Chapter 1, chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. Here's what happens when something devoted to the Lord is withheld. Is withheld. Acts 5, 1 to 5. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property with his wife's full knowledge. He kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Let's pause here. In the early church, you know, whenever there are poor among them, those who are wealthy, who have properties, will sell their properties, give it to the apostles, so the apostles can distribute it among the poor. That's why in the early church, there was no poor among them, according to Acts chapter 4. In the community of Christians in, the, in, the, in Jerusalem, according to Acts 4, there was no poor among them. Because everybody who had property would sell them, put it at the apostles' feet, because now they are devoting these properties to the Lord for the use of the Lord in order to meet the needs of others. So they put it at the apostles' putting something at the apostles' feet is an expression of dedication. I'm dedicating this to the Lord so that it will meet the needs of others. And so the apostles are the one who decide to whom this money will be given. Because there were many poor among them. Amen? Should there be any poor among us? In BCI? Should there be any poor among us? <laughs> Important question to think about. Okay? And so, in other words, Ananias and Sapphira already made a pledge that the proceeds from the sale of their property was to be devoted to God, to be used for God's purpose. Do you understand that? But they compromise. Instead of giving everything, Ananias, with the full knowledge of his wife, decided to keep some for himself. Now, once something is devoted to God, that's God's, that's not yours. You have no right anymore to touch that. Okay? Because that's dedicated to God. Do you understand what this is saying? This is New Testament. We're talking about something that applies to us today. Okay? So, because Ananias and Sapphira cheated, 
Once you devote something to God, that means God will claim ownership of that because you dedicated it. You understand that? If you withdraw from that, it will not please God. It will not please God. And so what happens is that even though they've devoted that property to God and all the proceeds from that, they decided, Ananias decided to keep back part of the money for himself. Now, how do you think God will react to that? Already they devoted their entire property to the Lord. And now they hold something back. How do you think God will like that? Take a look at verse, the next verse. Then Peter said, see, God revealed this to Peter prophetically. He revealed the hearts of Ananias and Sapphira, the Holy Spirit showed, so that that practice will be stopped right there and then, so that nobody will do that ever again. Okay? So what happens? Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? You said you are giving everything to God. You are lying. You did not give everything to God. Okay? And have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? You man, that's yours. Okay? And after it was sold, wasn't that money at your disposal? But you made a commitment to God. You said, God, I'm giving you all the proceeds of this property. Before you made that promise, you have all the rights over your money. But the moment you devoted that to God, it's no longer yours. Amen? Thus he said, did that the money belong to you before it was sold? After it was sold, was it the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. You lied to God, I'm going to give you all everything. And then when you gave oh, only part of it, you've lied to God. Okay? When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. And later on, Sapphira will come in and she will also lie. And immediately, she falls dead. Do you understand this? Now, praise God, this only happened once. <laughs> Because the sin of precedence, the first one to commit a sin that could cause others to follow that sin is the one who receives the stricter, the heaviest, the more severe judgment. Do you understand that? Kasi siyang mag influence ng iba. He, because he was the first one to do it. You call that the sin of precedence. If your sin causes others to follow you, you become what the New Testament says, what Jesus says, a stumbling block. Because you're causing other people to fall into sin by your example. You understand that? So if you do something that has not been done yet in a community of people, and you're the first one to do that, you will experience more severe judgment. You understand that? Because you're going to influence others to follow your example. I'll give you an example. How many of you have the experience? I don't know in Dabo City, but in Manila, this is very common. When somebody does, you know, in a heavy traffic, Somebody wants to get a way out of the traffic. So he goes and goes to the other lane, right? You call that, what do you call that? Counterflow? Counterflow. Because he's really in a hurry. It's a long traffic. And you know, when somebody gets out there, do you think he'll be alone? <laughs> Others will follow the example. When you get there, when the police says, stop, who gets the ticket? The first one. Sometimes the police will spare the others, but the first one will never hindi makakalusot. Because he's the one who led the others to violate the law. Of course, the others are also responsible for their decisions. Dapat ang sila bigyan ng ticket, eh, sa dami. <laughs> and decision ng mga police, yung sa una na lang, kasi siya pasimuno eh. He became a standing block to the others, caused them to sin and violate the law. But remember, the others are still also responsible for what they did before the law. Do you understand this? But again, that's what we're saying, that the first one to commit the sin that, will, that can infect others will suffer more severe judgment. You call that a stumbling block. That's why in the New Testament, Christ warns stumbling blocks because it's better for you to tie a millstone around your neck and cause yourself to be drowned in the depths of the sea for what you have done. You have caused others to sin. Amen? So I'm going to share this loving warning and loving exhortation to our women. Okay? Please be careful how you dress. Okay? 
it's okay to have fashion. But wag naman masyadong revealing. Kasi, madadala mo ang mga lalaki sa kasalanan. Of course, they will be responsible for their action to look at you lustfully. Kasalanan nila yon. Pero kung maayos ang damit mo, hindi sila madadala sa tukso. Hindi sila ma walang tukso. Do you understand this? Okay? That's why it's important for us to be careful that we do not become a cause of sin for others. Because if we do become a cause of sin, we become a stumbling block, God will have to deal with us. Do you understand this? I love you, the ladies of this church, but we need to be, be honor God even by the way we dress. Okay? Mag-ingat rin kayo sa mga posting-posting nyo sa FB. Lalo yung mga beauty shots. Be sure you're well-dressed. Hindi yung magiging tukso sa mga lalaki na makakita. Baka later on, medyo matipuhan ka. Later on, something bad is going to happen to you. You know those stories in Facebook, right? Women have been raped and murdered because they were just too beautiful in Facebook and somebody got interested in them and located where they live and then they are raped and they die. You understand this? It's better to be careful rather than be very fashionable. Amen. So stumbling blocks, okay? And because this was the first time it happened, Ananias and Faria suffered severe and they died. And this gave a warning to the others. Do not lie to God. When you give something to God, when you commit yourself to devote something to God, wag mong babawiin. Kasi just na may nun. Hallelujah, amen? Okay, so, now you understand what's going on here. Because Achan took what is devoted to God, the entire army was defeated because God was not with them. God separated himself with them. And without God's presence with them, they are really at the mercy of their enemies. Imagine, Israelites here were around 3,000 invaded I, and according to the spies, I only have a few people in it. Isn't that embarrassing? 3,000 men against a small population, and they were defeated by the small population. How, how embarrassing that can be. And that's why Joshua, in his prayer to God, was saying, the Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this. God, you allowed your people to be defeated. What will the people in this land say? Okay? They will surround us and wipe us from the face of the earth, our name from the earth. What, what then would you do for your own great name? Because your name will be slandered against because you were defeated. You understand this? Okay? And that's why it's important for us here to see that once you disobey God, you'll have to be ready for the consequences. Amen? And God disciplines us for our good. Amen? Where do you think did uh, Ananias and Sapphira go? Heaven or hell? Where do you think they went? <laughs> Take a look at 1 Corinthians 11, okay, beginning in verse 28. Okay? God taking the life of a believer is an is a manifestation of divine judgment and discipline, okay? And this is described by Paul here. He's talking about people who were taking the Lord's Supper in a very, you know, they were not honoring the Lord's Supper, okay? Because some of them get, get drunk on the wine that is supposedly to represent the blood of Christ. And so they were really dishonoring the Lord's Supper. Everyone ought to examine this before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Next verse. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgments on themselves. Next verse. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have. You know what falling asleep means? Die. Prematurely. Okay? He said, the reason why some of you are very sick and your sickness cannot be cured by doctors, sometimes it can even defy diagnosis. When that kind of sickness falls upon you, Peter, uh, Paul is saying to the Corinthians, and then you die prematurely. You're too young. That is divine judgment. That's divine discipline. So next verse, sir. So where do you go if you're a believer and God, you know, disciplines you with death? Next verse. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, do you see that we? Do you see we? Does that include Paul? 
So Paul can also experience the judgment, right? So when we are judged in this way, that is sickness and death, by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So where do you go? Where do you go? You still go to heaven, but too early. So in the, in the, in the disciplines of God, sickness is one. But not all sickness means that God is judging you, okay? There are sickness that are the result of our own kapabayaan sa ating health. Tama? Like recently, I just had a problem with urinal stones. Too much cholesterol. <laughs> okay? So God's not that gonna spare you from illnesses that you brought upon yourself. Okay? Or kung hindi ka maingat, pwede ka mahawa ng sakit ng iba because you are not protecting yourself, right? Tama? But, there are certain sicknesses that will come to you without any seeming any cause at all. And it's hard to cure, sometimes hard to diagnose. That can be a manifestation of divine judgment. If you know you're living in sin. But you know you're not living a life of sin, ah, pagsubok lang yun. Okay? So, they went to heaven, but they died prematurely because of their violation of their devotion, dev commitment to God to give everything to the Lord. They lied to God. They lied to men. Just as Achan said, I have lied. Chapter 7. Can we look at that? Verse 11. Verse 11. Here it is. This is God's indictment against Achan. God is saying, Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. And they have put them with their own possessions. That's the charge of God against Achan. He stole what is mine because these things are devoted to me. They stole what is mine and they lied about it. Just like Ananias and Sapphira. So when, they, when Ananias set, kept back part of what has been devoted to the Lord, he was stealing from God and he lied about God. He lied to God because he said he's going to give him everything. Are you still here? Okay? So that's why those devoting things are very dangerous, especially when you try to covet them. That's what happened to Achan. But the most interesting thing in this story is this. That is what should prepare us for the new year. Do you know that this is the first time that Joshua prayed? You know, if you study the life of Joshua from, you know, Numbers, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, up to the book of Joshua, you never see him, you know, and there, there's no record of him praying something to God. We know when he's there in the, in the tent of meeting, I mean, you know, he is worshiping God. But this is the first record of a petition, a petition, a prayer petition that came from Joshua. This is the first. And I, I want you to show that Joshua is not always the great person we thought he was. And we thank God he's not perfect. Because if he was, we cannot follow him. <laughs> it's too perfect. Okay? Now, I want you to see what he said that caused God to respond, verse 10, with such firmness. Stand up! What are you doing down there in your face? Uh, why, why would God be so upset with Joshua? Take a look at this prayer. Verse 6 and following. Then Joshua tore his clothes because the Israelites were defeated by the small population of Ai. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And remember, in the book of Numbers, he would always be there. Always be there. Never leaving the tent with the ark of God. He was always there worshiping God. He's a true worshiper. That is his favorite place in the camp. The tent where the ark of the covenant rested. He was truly a worshiper. And so the word of God said, he fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord and remained there till evening. Now, that's not new to Joshua. He's been doing that for a long time, many times, okay? The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on her. That means repentance. Kung makasalanan namin, Lord, patawarin mo kami, okay? We are reminding ourselves that of death because ashes refers to death. That means I'm going to die, okay? And Joshua said, now listen to his prayer. Alas! Because in Tagalog, ano ba yan? <laughs> Alas, Sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring these people across the Jordan? You opened the Jordan River just for us. To deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. 
Does the word I'm right, Rekabel? Remember God's word to Abraham in Genesis? The sin of the Amorites have not yet reached full measure. But this time it has. That's why it was the duty of Israel to destroy everyone, to destroy everything, okay? And he's saying, if only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Wow. That sounds like the, <laughs> sounds like the 11 spies way back 40 years ago <laughs> that caused God to judge Israel and make them wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Because those spies said, we cannot get to the land. Let's go back to Egypt. Why did we have to go there? We'll all die there. And here comes Joshua, who was the one who became the hero of God because he said, no, God will give the land to us. They will become food to us. That's not the opposite, not vice versa. You're saying that we will be food for them and our children will be food to these giants in the land. No, they will be food to us because our God is with us. So because of his faith and obedience to God, God said to Moses, all these people, this generation that spited me will die in the wilderness in 40 years, except for Joshua and Caleb because they've been faithful to me. Are you still here? This Joshua, 40 years ago, was a man of faith. Nothing can make him afraid because he knows God is with him. Now, what do you think happens when he goes into a battle and they're completely defeated? That means God is no longer with them, right? Now, do you see the background why he said this? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Now, do you think that's very nice to say to God? <laughs> After all that God did, you know, the Jordan River, you know, and make the walls of Jericho fall down. God said, I have been the one to defeat your enemies. Remember the walls of Jericho. I destroyed those walls without anything, you know, from you. No battering rams, no weapon from you except just praise me. Do you understand this? So he concluded that God is no longer with them because they were defeated. Now, if God is no longer with them, they have no reason to proceed. But pa doon na lang kami the other side of the Jordan. So what he's actually doing now, he's complaining, right? He's somehow, somehow like rebuking God. How many of you times when you pray for something and then a disappointment comes? You know, they really expected victory. As God named victory over Jericho, he knew God would give them victory over I. But the disappointment came because when they were completely defeated. How many have been praying to God for something and then you're expecting it to happen and then suddenly it doesn't happen? How many experienced that? Okay. Our tendency is to ask the word why, right? Why? That's exactly what Joshua said. Why? Okay? So Joshua was very human. Where is the man of faith? Where is the man of courage? Okay? He said, Why did you ever bring these people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Why? I really thank God that Joshua was very human. It's like he criticized God. You know, Lord, sana doon na lang kami sa kabila. Sana doon na lang kami nagstay sa Jordan. Siguro hindi kami makakaranas ng ganito. You know, we'll be better off there. What an insult to God, right? Have you ever found Sasha sometimes insulting God that way? Sana, Lord, hindi na lang ganyan. Sana, sana. Because hindi mo naman binagay yung nangyayin ko eh. I was expecting it. Tatampo-tampo ka kay Lord ngayon. And then you say things against God that is not fair. And does not honor God at all. But the beautiful thing about God's relationship with Joshua is that God was very patient with Joshua. Amen? And because of Jesus Christ's blood that was shed on the cross for our sins, even in our sin, God remains patient. Amen? Can you say to the person beside you, God is patient with you because He's not finished with you yet. But if you keep on sinning, He may finish you. Because he loves you. He said, Umuwi ka na, anak. Umuwi ka na. I'll take you home. 
You understand that? Okay? And so here, he was complaining. Why? Lord, he already jumped to conclusion that God was being unfair, that God was being deceiving. You brought us here only to be slaughtered by the Amorites. He sounded like the spies 40 years ago. Okay? And listen, if only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan, pardon your servant, Lord. At least marunong siya mag-sorry. <laughs> pardon me, Lord. <laughs> okay? Nalalabas ko lang yung sama ng loob ko. Kasi kawawa kami ngayon, Lord, when, the, when the, the nations in this land hear that we were utterly defeated, it will embolden them to attack us together and we will be destroyed. Sira ng reputation mo, Lord. Sira ng pangalan mo. Sino po mag honor sa iyo? Eh, kaya ka palang talunin. Remember, in ancient times, the battle, human battles, was also believed, always believed to be the battle of the gods. That's why in ancient times, every army that goes to battle have to worship their God in order to give them victory in the battle. And they see battles as the battle of the whose God is more powerful. So the army that wins in a battle, that nation, their God is more powerful than the God of the nation that they defeated. That was their concept. And so when Joshua said, what will the nation say about your name? What will you do about your name? You just humiliated yourself. You understand that? Can you say to the person beside you, thank God, God was patient with Joshua. Even though he was very insulting. Okay? And so how did God respond? He didn't answer the question, right? He just said, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? I mean, doesn't God delight in the worship? <laughs> I mean, Joshua's favorite place was there at the foot of the Ark of the Covenant, Book of Numbers. We have seen him spending time there, Exodus, spending time there. Just his favorite place of worship. Now, why is God now rebuking him for putting his face on the ground? And that should be something that should please him, right? 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 So he's saying, what are you doing on your face? Because this time he was on his face not to worship God. He was on his face to question God. He said, get up. You may have the posture of worship, but inside of you, you are criticizing me. Get up! Amen? Stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. <gasps> Lord, hindi ko alam. Ngayon, alam mo na. <laughs> so let me tell you this. When disappointments come, go to God in prayer. And don't jump into conclusions. There are two kinds of whys that you can ask from God. The why that is already conclusive. That you made already a judgment about God. Why? Yun yung why na ayaw ng Diyos. Okay? Sino sa inyo nakasigaw na ng why? Galit na kayo kasi eh. And tingin mo, Diyos is so God is so unfair. How many of you said that why? That angry why? Amen? Okay. Actually, most of us. God is patient with you. Amen? Bakit, Lord? Okay. There's another kind of why that pleases God. That is the why of Habakkuk, the prophet. He says, Lord, I could not understand. This seems to, be, to, this seems to go against your nature. And this is not you. I'm confused. May I ask why? Okay. So there is a why of judgment and there is a why of confusion. Right? Remember Elizabeth, uh, Zechariah, and Mary? Zechariah did not believe what the angel said. Mary believed in her. How can this happen? Was well, a question of confusion. And so God proceeded to answer his question. So when you come to God, when you're disappointed, don't be judgmental. Pagkasabi sa katabi mo, don't be judgmental of God. Dahil nakaka-insulto ka. Rather, come to God and say, God, I don't understand. May I ask why? And if you go to God with that kind of attitude, a why that only seeks to be clarified, 
Not a why we're judging God, you're unfair, you're not faithful. Ah, yun ang ayaw ng Diyos. You will receive a revelation. You receive an answer. Because you have the right attitude. Amen? And I'm telling you, don't hesitate to ask the why. Because it is the will of God for you to know Him more. To know His purposes. But be very careful with the kind of why you ask. Amen? So walang masama, Lord, ang sakit, hindi ko magagets. Can you please clarify why? Hindi ako galit sa iyo, Lord. Because I know you know your ways, and your ways are perfect. But I'm just confused. I know your ways are higher than your ways, and your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. I cannot debate with you. But can you just give me some insight para namang, you know, makalma ako. Why this thing happened? Amen? You see, Joshua received a revelation because of the patience of God with him, God still gave him an answer. Israel has sinned. That's why. Okay, and he's saying here, they have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them in their own possession. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been liable to the, made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. What is the message for us? I will encourage you as you face 2019, remember that everything will always be smooth in your life. There will be challenges. There will be experiences that will come to you that will make you question God. But let me tell you this. Every challenge, every crisis in your life is meant to humble you and bring you back to God. God's expected response is that you go to Him in prayer and seek His wisdom. Instead of complaining, instead of, mag, you know, maghinanakit ka sa Diyos, because you have no right to, to be bitter against God. He owns everything in your life. He even owns your breath. Don't dishonor God. He wants you to come to Him. Because if you're earnestly seeking His mind about what happened, He will answer you. And that revelation will help you understand God's purpose and how you will handle your situation. Do you understand this? Pray. I'm going to give it. Sino po mga may asawa rito? Can you raise your hands? Okay. Can you adopt this principle? Pag kayo mag na about something, can you just say, okay, amuna, break, break. The fact that galit na tayo, nag that mess, kailangan na natin magpray. <laughs> Instead of fight about it, pray about it first. If you're going to discuss something with your spouse, be sure you pray first so that God will give you wisdom. Right? And if you're disappointed about your discussion, then pray again. Because in the end, only God has the answers because only God is sovereign. He con takes control of all your circumstances. He knows why things are happening. He allowed it to happen that way. He is in control. That's why you need to seek His wisdom. You need to pray and ask God. You see, He was saying, He was not asking for any specific thing from God. He was saying, I just want to know why, Lord. You can understand this, what we're going to do now. But you have to do that with humility. Amen? And listen to this. You may have plans this year, but without God in your plans, as we saw in this story, there's no guarantee your plans will succeed. Because Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. That's why if you want God to give you the results that you seek, spend time in prayer. God wants to see us humbling ourselves before Him and recognizing that He is God. Hindi tayo ang Diyos. Siya ang Diyos. And when God sees you humbling yourself in prayer, He will draw near to you. And He will enlighten you. He will bless you with His wisdom. And He will change what you cannot change. Because you confess, Lord, hindi ko kaya ito. Pero kaya mo ito. 
I bring this to you now. That is the kind of attitude that truly honors God. Amen? That's why when you suffer a major disappointment in your life, let me remind you, God is trying to tell you something. If you have experienced successive disappointments, mukha mabigat yung gustong sabihin sa'yo ng Lord. The proper response is to pray. Amen? But if you are praying every day, you will gain wisdom. Hindi ka na magtatanong later on ng why because alam mo na. Be in prayer for your family to ensure that the favor of God will always be there. Be in prayer so that even when you face disappointments and challenges, God will give you insight to understand so you will know how to respond and how to handle your situations. I'm going to encourage you today, let's give more time to pray this year. Can you bow in prayer? Father in heaven, we know that you teach us to pray because you want us to express our humility. And humility honors you. The humility to recognize that without you we are nothing. That you alone are God. And that everything that we enjoy in this life are expressions of your love for us. They come from you as the source. And I thank you, Father, because you continue to bless me. There may be things that you're doing in my life that I do not understand. Lord, I have faced disappointments last year. But I'm not going to be judgmental like Joshua. I'm going to ask why because I seek clarification. And I know at the right time, you will answer me. And Lord, I thank you for the challenges that are coming this year because you will be in those challenges waiting for me. When the storm comes, you will be walking above the storm to come to me. Lord, I ask your forgiveness if I have not honored you by giving thanks to you every day for what you have done for us or the things that you give us this day. Forgive me for not being thankful. And then, know, oh Lord, that it really honors you when you hear thanksgiving because it is expressing that we appreciate you for your faithfulness and your goodness. That even in our disappointments, we know something good is going to happen. So that even in the midst of disappointments, we can come to say, Lord, thank you. I may not understand why you are allowing this to happen. But I know something good is going to come out of this. If I just respond the way you want me to. To respond in faith rather than in bitterness. Lord, forgive me if I've ever questioned you in a judgmental manner in any way this past year. I repent, Lord, for judging you. Forgive me of my sins. And Lord, this year, I ask you to take full control of my life. And I will spend time to pray, to humble myself before you, because it is your desire that I am always dependent on you, because you want intimacy with me. And Lord, I will satisfy your heart's desire. It is my prayer that I will be more intimate with you this year. So you'll have the guidance and the wisdom I need to understand the things that are happening. Because you are the one revealing this to me, speaking to me. Lord, grant me the desire to be intimate with you. Forgive me for my lack of prayer. Forgive me for my pride that often keeps me from praying as if I can do everything without you. When everything comes from your hand, I acknowledge that you are the source. You alone are the source of everything I have. Thank you so much, Father. I honor you and I say thank you with all my heart for all the things that you've done for me. And I will give thanks to you for what you're going to do this year. The provision that's coming, I give thanks to you. The breakthrough that's coming, I give thanks to you right now. Lord, the salvation of my loved ones, I give thanks to you. Lord, mababayaran ko utang ko this year, I give thanks to you. 
Lord, you will release me from bondage because I trust in you. I thank you, Lord. And just right now, can you just thank God for the things that you anticipate of God meeting your needs? Start thanking Him for the provision that's coming because that honors God. It touches His heart. It's expressive of faith and dependence. Thank God that your marriage will be healed by God. Thank God that you and your parents, God will reconcile you. Start thanking God now for the specific request you've been praying for. It's time to thank God because God's going to do it. And say this in your heart, Lord, make me a man and woman of prayer this year because everything comes from your hand. I will be dependent on you. I will humble myself. I thank you, Lord, for speaking to me today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior. And if today you do not have the full assurance in your heart that Jesus Christ is in you, I invite you to just make a prayer saying, Jesus, come into my life. You are my Savior, and I trust in you. And I commit to follow you as the Lord of my life. I'm turning away from all my sins, and I ask you to change my life. Just say that right now in your heart. If you haven't done this before, just say, Lord, come into my life. I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. And I will walk with you by your grace. Change my heart and lead me to the purpose that you have prepared for me. I surrender all to you. I will obey you and follow you. In the name of Jesus. 